So it's a great pleasure to have Professor Steve Giddings with us in the QSTM 41th seminar series. He's from University of California, Santa Barbara, and uh, his area of expertise is quantum gravity, string theory, and um, particularly he will talk about black hole today. His uh, uh, title of the talk is quantum gravity mathematical structure and black hole evolution and for the students those who are not aware of him everybody is aware of him but just for general introduction so he did his phd with uh, professor edward wheaton from princeton university and uh, then uh, he joined uh, at uh, uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. And uh, so I'm just reading from the, this uh, Inspire ATP. They didn't mention that when you have joined. Uh, I came to Santa Barbara in 1990. Okay, 99. Okay. So, uh, uh, like from that time, he's uh, continuing. And uh, it's a great pleasure that you agree to give the talk in this pandemic time and uh, we are all welcoming you from Potsdam so you can start okay well <clears throat> thank you very much for the uh, introduction and for the kind invitation uh, I'm looking forward to sharing some things that I think are very interesting and intriguing and puzzling so and that of course is on the uh, topic of quantum gravity uh, and its mathematical structure and the big puzzles of black holes. So this will be a little uh, longer talk than uh, <coughs> the typical, perhaps, uh, given the... the uh, it, it, sorry, I can I interrupt now. And uh, nice to see you again. But all I can... I'm Sudhakar Panda from India. And... Uh, what I see you now is that you look much younger than last I met you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the secret of the story, but that's personal. We'll talk in privately, but I'm happy to see you again. And please continue the talk and hopefully I will learn something now. Thank you. Maybe the uh, younger than uh, before is a Zoom trick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> we met in TIFR and we met in other places. But nice to see you, but you really look young. I could not uh, just wait till the end to tell you that uh, I see a much younger Steve. Compared to what I see. Thank you. Please well, continue. I, I wish it were true. <laughs> so, anyway. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So in outline, uh, I will uh, first talk a little bit about my perspective on quantum gravity, the nature of the problem of quantum gravity and a uh, possible approach to it, uh, which may sound a little bit different from some of the approaches you've heard discussed. Uh, and then I'll turn to the concrete example of black holes and uh, how some of the questions apply in the context of black holes and make contact with what I call the unitarity crisis. It's also called the information paradox. Then I'll go uh, to discussing more generally how we think about subsystems and the mathematical structure of quantum gravity, uh, which ties back to the black hole question. Uh, then I'll say a few things about uh, how we might think about black hole evolution and its reconciliation with quantum mechanics. And finally, uh, conclude. So that's the outline. So the problem of quantum gravity uh, is, I think, uh, widely recognized as being one of the most difficult problems in physics. Of course, there's been a traditional approach to this, and uh, that's been pursued for many, many years, uh, which was to start with general relativity and then follow some quantization rules and uh, try to arrive at a quantum theory. Now, the problem that was encountered with that, uh, as is well known, <coughs> is the non-renormalizability uh, of the theory, if you try to perturbatively quantize, you know, really that's a short distance problem. It involves, you know, short distance or uh, ultraviolet divergences in diagrams that appear uh, that we have trouble dealing with. 
Uh, and so that looked like that was what was standing in the way and really was much of the traditional focus of the program of quantum gravity. But really, it appears that there's a deeper problem, uh, and we've learned this over the years by uh, studying some of the things I'm going to talk about today, which is a problem of non-unitarity. And that's something that we don't necessarily find diagram by diagram, uh, and uh, we don't find necessarily perturbatively. Uh, we start to see maybe some hints of it perturbatively. But really, it's something that occurs when you study high energy scattering, which can form black holes. That's just one way of forming black holes. And this turns out to be a very long distance problem, it appears. Uh, and uh, it also appears to be both a more profound problem than that of non renormalizability. And to my mind, that makes it look like a more uh, central problem uh, in the uh, problem of quantizing gravity, uh, it looks like, you know, really that's, that's where the, the really uh, new insight is going to have to come is in resolving that problem. And maybe by the time we resolve that problem, we won't even be thinking about the non-renormalizability issues anymore. So these problems appear to reveal a basic inconsistency uh, between the underlying principles, and I hope people can see the cursor here, uh, the underlying principles that serve as the foundation stones of our best current description of physics. So almost everything in physics, uh, everything we've seen besides gravity, <coughs> can be described within the framework of local quantum field theory. And really, local quantum field theory is a way of reconciling a basic set of principles, the principles of quantum mechanics, the principles of relativity, <coughs> and the principle of locality. Uh, and so when you try to put those together, local quantum field theory is what you end up with. Of course, if you put together the principles of relativity and the principle of locality, I'm being a little schematic here, uh, that's what tells you that uh, you have a starting point of basically uh, you know, general relativity, uh, it tells you you have classical geometry and topology uh, that is uh, specifically related to the fact that you describe space-time as a manifold. <clears throat> and then we add on the uh, principles of quantum mechanics and uh, we find that we have this basic inconsistency between uh, those underlying principles. So what do we do about that? Well, there are various approaches uh, that have been taken over the years. Uh, of course, string theory is quite famous, uh, loop quantum gravity is quite famous, uh, and so on. Uh, it's worth emphasizing that these really came out of this long-standing focus on the non-renormalizability problem. For example, string theory's original claim to fame was it was addressing the uh, non-renormalizability problem by regulating ultraviolet divergences. <coughs> None of these really tell us how to resolve the unitarity problem, at least yet. Uh, some hints have certainly been provided, uh, but we don't have a complete uh, and convincing story. Uh, and one other thing I want to emphasize, these approaches are based on the approach of <clears throat> taking a classical theory, whether it's space-time, you know, general relativity, or uh, a slightly different version of the story, uh, which is similar to that in the context of string theory, taking a classical theory and quantizing it. But <clears throat> what I'm going to suggest here is that we look at this from a different point of view. So, so instead of taking the uh, cyclical theory of geometry, which comes, as I mentioned, from this two set or these two principles combined. Uh, instead of taking uh, classical geometry and quantizing it, trying to apply the principles of quantum mechanics, uh, what I would like to suggest is that we start with a quantum mechanical theory. So we start with the principles of quantum mechanics, begin with the end in mind, and try to ask what kind of mathematical structure within those principles uh, allow us to approximately recover uh, the things that lie down here, namely 
space-time geometry, familiar description of gravity, and so on. And here we can use the fact that quantum mechanics is a tightly constraining uh, framework. Really, it's, it's quite tightly constraining. Uh, and that should help us. So the basic notion is that we should be geometrizing quantum mechanics, if you want a slogan, uh, rather than quantizing geometry. That's the suggestion here, that we turn the, uh, turn the logic around here. <clears throat> and so we might call this a quantum first approach to gravity. Uh, this is something I've been uh, investigating various aspects of uh, over the years. And uh, uh, Sean Carroll and his collaborators also have been uh, investigating aspects of this as well, uh, or at least aspects of a similar approach uh, with a similar spirit and philosophy. So again, the starting point is uh, the postulates of uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, we've got to figure out you know, how we should formulate quantum mechanics, but we assume that we start out with a quantum mechanical theory. And then another uh, key postulate is that uh, you know, whatever we're doing, it should match on to this really good description we have of the rest of, or you know, most of nature through local quantum field theory. So in the weak gravity regime, uh, you should have a correspondence principle uh, in the weak gravity limit with local quantum field theory uh, together with general relativity. That should serve as a, a very good approximate description uh, as we observationally find for uh, phenomena in the, at least in the weak gravitational regime. So given that, uh, how, well, how do we start? And uh, uh, one question, just yeah. uh, why this, uh, like, like for this kind of approach, why the gravity limit is important? Uh, well, the basic point is we want a complete uh, quantum theory of gravity in the end. So we'd like to have a description of both weak and strong regimes. Yes. Uh, but whatever we're doing uh, should match on to what we already know. It's uh, like other correspondence uh, stories. For example, uh, when special relativity came about, it had to match on to Newtonian laws in the familiar uh, you know, low velocity regime. Okay, so it's a similar story here that uh, if we have a more complete theory, uh, then that should uh, in the limit where uh, we know that our current theory is applicable, it should reduce to that theory to a good approximation. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But is it uh, uh, something to do with decoupling limit? People sometimes use something called decoupling limit. Um, well, it's... It, it's sort of, it's not exactly a decoupling limit because I think we have a description of gravity, not just, well, if we think about gravity as what's decoupling, I'm not sure if that's what you're saying, but we have a, a good treatment of gravity in a regime where it's, you know, not fully decoupled, obviously. Uh, you know, we have a pretty good description of what's going on in the, uh, you know, on scales ranging from, uh, you know, the scales we see in everyday life to, the scale of the uh, uh, galaxies and universe. So uh, we certainly have a, a good semi-classical description of uh, interacting gravity as well. And so we should be able to match onto that. Uh, but uh, one thing that we don't regularly probe in everyday life is the strong gravity regime. And what do I mean by that? Well, one example of that is the regime in the vicinity of a uh, black hole, which is a very large deviation uh, space. Yes. Steve, I have a question here, please. Yes. Are you thinking like, when you said that near the black hole, etc., I will solve a Schrodinger type equation for a particle, let's say an electron, how it bears, in the potential of a black hole and solve a Schrodinger equation, if not wheeler dewitt equation. Are you thinking in this term? Well, we could try that. That's one approach to trying to describe the quantum dynamics in the vicinity of a black hole. 
as we'll see, there's something wrong with that. That's going to be one of the issues and one of the points. I, I will think that I will run into anything, whether it is black hole source or any other gravitational potential source, because gravitational potential is as well uh, like Coulomb potential. When I'm talking about a particle, my problem I find is that even an electron in a Coulomb potential, uh, I just write the Coulomb potential because I know the electric charge of this and the corresponding uh, background where it is. But gravity is something that it's, it's always there. It's basically the interaction between energy and energy. So I don't know which particle is the probe particle in what background. They are supposed to interact with each other. Or, For example, why can't I think of a black hole is a probe in presence of some other gravitational potential. Which is the probe and which is the supplying me the potential? That's my problem when I think about quantum mechanics in gravity. You, can you please, uh, please can you say me something so that my this misunderstanding will go away? <clears throat> well, I think you know, in general, you know, we'd like to be able to describe all kinds of situations. And certainly there are situations where black holes are both probes and uh, backgrounds. For example, we talk about with Lisa, ultimately being able to see a gravitational in spiral with a small black hole following in, into a big one. And you might think of the small one as a probe and the big one as a background. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, there are various approximate ways we have of treating such situations, say within local quantum field theory plus GR. Yes. But in the end, the, the uh, more profound question in my mind is how to give, and I'll explain this more fully as I go on, how to give a consistent quantum treatment of the evolution of a black hole. And there, there is a profound problem, which I think is pushing us to a different kind of description that's outside of local quantum field theory plus semi-classical GR. And I'm trying to get at uh, what that could be. So basically you are saying that if I consider a probe particle in a background, in a black hole background, which itself is evolving, how to make a quantum mechanical treatment of those systems. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, in the end, we'd like to at least have, in principle, a description of, uh, you know, of such systems in a fully quantum mechanical fashion. And, you know, we're used to this kind of thing, say, in particle physics, when you're looking at, say, collisions at the LHC, uh, you just have a quantum description of the evolution of the multi-particle system, and you don't think of one as being the probe and the other as the background. So, uh, you know, they're there. Quantum field theory gives us a very good description of the evolution of the wave function in that context. But uh, there the problem is that we still, all those systems who look into conserve some charges, whether it is electrical charge, color quantum number, etc. Always yeah. keep in mind that what is conserved. My problem with gravity is that I don't know what is conserved. It's an energy energy interaction. What is conserved there? And well, any, any objects we take, and in the, in the quantum gravity real, if you approach, and I will feel that all other interaction play a subdominant role compared to the gravitational interaction, at least in the level of 10 to the power 19 GeV or whatever we see. And yeah, well, maybe let me, let me continue on. My focus is not going to be on at least local conservation laws, although in gravity, if we're in an asymptotically flat background or even asymptotically anti de Sitter, uh, there are conserved uh, global quantities. Of course, the total energy and more generally the point charge is in an asymptotic background. When can it happen? Yeah, yeah, of course, the, you know, the momentum, angular momentum, and so on. So, uh, you know, those are nice conserved things in an asymptotically flat background, at least in the field theory description of things. But uh, let's... Okay, asymptotically flat backgrounds really will not tell us anything about where quantum gravity is dominant. Uh, say again? Asymptotically flat limits will not give us the detailed picture about what's happening in a 
in a real gravitational background where it is strong, asymptotically it's a flat space. So I can assume that the quantum gravity is not playing a big role there. Oh, no, no, no. There, there are certainly ways of uh, probing the structure of quantum gravity uh, with asymptotically flat uh, geometries, just asymptotically flat, right? For example, one of the things we could consider is a very high energy collision with two particles coming in uh, with a super Planckian center of mass energy. And when they're far apart, that's not going to be a huge deformation of the uh, flat background. They sort of go out and uh, locally just look like uh, you know, two boosted particles. But then if they, once they collide, they will form, uh, if they collide at a small enough impact parameter, will form a black hole, we expect, which then can decay. So you can study, say, scattering processes like that in the asymptotically flat context and try to learn about properties of uh, the strong gravity regime that way. So, so actually having asymptotically flat geometries uh, can be very useful in trying to think about properties of quantum gravity. So for example, um, if I look into the asymptotically flat limit, can I reconstruct my theory, whether I started with a de-sitter background or an anti de -sitter background? How will they differ in asymptotically flat space type? Sorry, how does what differ in asymptotically flat? Suppose we start with a DC torque background or an anti DC torque background. Yeah. In the flat asymptotic limit, how yeah. do I know where from I started? Well, I think you could consider, uh, you know, various backgrounds, uh, you know, de sitter, anti de sitter, or asymptotically flat. And if you're studying phenomena on scales that are at short distances as compared to the ambient curvature scale, then a lot of the things are going to look very much the same. Okay, you know, if you look at scales yeah, short. My point. Not same, but anyway, but I think this is a little bit of a diversion from what I would like to say here. Uh, we can come back to this, but uh, if I could, I'd, maybe I could yeah, continue yeah. on. And I'll wait till the end, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so in any case, uh, back to what I was saying. Uh, well, what are our postulates uh, when we think about a quantum first approach to gravity? And uh, so key postulates, properties of quantum mechanics, which we'll talk about, uh, correspondence in appropriate situations, uh, weak gravity regimes like we're familiar with for most purposes. Uh, but then there's uh, really a central question in all of this. Uh, you know, if we're going to start out with quantum mechanics, what mathematical structure within that framework uh, can give a consistent theory that provides such a correspondence with local quantum field theory plus general relativity? And uh, in all of this, of course, mathematical consistency of the uh, framework of the story is an important and implicit postulate. So one of my goals today is to describe how we infer uh, at least some aspects of that mathematical structure that uh, we think is relevant. Okay, so first, how do we even think about quantum mechanics uh, in the context of gravity where we might not want to start out with a uh, fundamental description uh, involving space-time? So, or, you know, time uh, is, you know, often one of the things you begin with in quantum mechanics, but we don't want to put that in at the start. Uh, and so one of the early attempts in this direction was uh, pioneered by Jim Hartle. Uh, called generalized quantum mechanics. He was trying to formulate a way to think about quantum mechanics that's general enough for describing gravity. Uh, but uh, in some respects, that seems not general enough. And in particular, he assumed an underlying structure of history, in particular space-time histories. And a while back, I was rather sort of bothered by that, that that was still putting in uh, maybe a little bit too much of a classical understanding of uh, gravity. And so uh, I asked myself, you know, what are sort of the um, universal elements of quantum mechanics, the things that we really expect that we have to have, and uh, did so in this paper uh, in uh, 2007. And 
you know, came to the conclusion the postulates are remarkably sparse. Uh, if you just want the bare essentials of quantum mechanics, you need a linear space of states, uh, something like a Hilbert space with as an inner product. Uh, you need an algebra of observables, and I call these Q observables to distinguish from, you know, the familiar things that we, uh, that observers observe. Uh, sometimes the nomenclature gets confused if you don't have a separate name. Uh, so basically linear operators with appropriate properties. And then, of course, uh, in appropriate context, like the one I was talking about, where we're describing, say, scattering in an asymptotically flat background, uh, you would like to have uh, unitary evolution. So, for example, unitarity of the S matrix for states with appropriate asymptotics. And so these are plausibly uh, the universal elements of what we might want to call a quantum theory. Uh, these basic, uh, this basic structure. Uh, but, you know, clearly we need more than that to actually describe a physical theory. So depending on what physical theory we're describing, we've got to introduce some additional uh, structure. And that's part of the question, what is that additional structure if we're talking about gravity? Well, in thinking about that, an increasingly important theme, which uh, many of us are, you know, well, we can see it everywhere, basically, an increasingly important theme uh, in describing quantum systems is that of quantum information. And there are various kinds of questions that one studies regarding quantum information. For example, how is it localized? Uh, that's the basis for sort of kinematics in a quantum theory. How does it transfer, uh, say, from place to place in a quantum system? Uh, that's uh, more a dynamical question. Uh, and so we need enough structure to describe uh, those questions and, and, you know, what happens with quantum information in various regards. A very concrete example is the example of a, uh, say, black hole. Uh, can we think of a black hole as being a quantum subsystem, maybe at least approximately, where information is localized? And I'm going to talk about that. And uh, does information transfer out of black holes? Uh, and in the end, that may lead to some possibly interesting observational consequences. Uh, here, I I'm going to next turn to this case of black holes, but let me just first mention that uh, what I'm saying is in contrast with some other current themes in physics. Uh, so I'm asking what mathematical structure, say, on the Hilbert space uh, sets up uh, an approach to these questions. Elsewhere, uh, it is sometimes proposed that you start out with just entanglement and then you end up with quantum space time. Uh, and so here, just to emphasize, I'm taking another approach where I'm thinking about this mathematical structure as being something like quantum space-time. And then once you have the basic mathematical structure in hand, you can describe things like entanglement and so on. So a different philosophy just to uh, describe uh, some contrast with some of the other things going on. Okay, so on to black holes. Is a black hole a quantum subsystem? And why, why might you care about that question? Uh, well, it's an important question because it connects to an apparent key problem in physics, uh, which is that of the unitarity crisis, I like to call it, or black hole information paradox. I like unitarity crisis because it reminds us that it's similar to other crises we've had in physics, like the crisis of atomic stability, uh, which led to the development, was one of the things leading to the development of quantum physics. So a lightning review of this. Uh, so uh, here's the essential problem. And this is a key slide for any of those of you who are unfamiliar with the subject, so pay close attention. Uh, so we can describe uh, collapsing matter, which uh, then forms a black hole. Here's the horizon in short radius. And uh, so this is a space-time diagram of time is going up and uh, say radial coordinate going out. And in the conventional description, we have a singularity here. Okay, so most of you are no doubt quite familiar with this. We would like to describe the evolution of black holes. Uh, and so we can draw some time slices, uh, say, if we want to describe the time evolution of a black hole geometry and the things moving in it. And of course, uh, 
we might talk about quantum field theory on such a background. And there are quantum fields, say, propagating in the black hole background. And uh, as we know, with quantum fields, there are basically you know, fluctuations at short distances of those fields that are always taking place. And the basic point of Hawking radiation is that uh, the gravitational field, in one way of saying it, near the horizon is so strong that those quantum fluctuations uh, get pulled apart and turned into outgoing uh, real particles that go out to infinity, the Hawking radiation, and ingoing partner excitations that fall deeper into the black hole. And uh, the outgoing particles have a typical energy, uh, which is of order the Hawking temperature. Uh, and the characteristic scale up to numbers of order unity is one over the radius of the black hole. R is the short shield radius of the black hole. And the kind of state that you end up with, say, on this slice is a state where you have, say, one of these excitations uh, entangled with the partner excitation inside the black hole. So one way of describing that in very simple terms is you have a state something like uh, zero or vacuum inside and vacuum outside. So no particle inside, no particle outside. Uh, plus uh, the state with one particle in a, outside and a partner particle inside, so hat is inside. Uh, and of course you could have multi-particles as well, uh, but let's just focus on one pair of particles. So you have this kind of entangled state uh, that looks like that. Okay, so this keeps happening. And, uh, or actually before I say that, so, so this kind of state is, uh, as I said, entangled uh, it's, it corresponds to the classic example of a bell, to a classic example of a bell state, uh, or uh, put differently, the kind of state we have when we describe EPR pairs. Okay, so there's this, this entanglement between these two uh, excitations. Okay, so this keeps happening, and uh, the rate is such that you have basically one Hawking quantum that comes out per time r. Uh, you know, I'm working in units where C equals one. So it keeps happening, and so the black hole loses energy and shrinks. Uh, the state that's produced, say, on a later time slice, is going to have <clears throat> a bunch of copies of a state like I've described. So this basic kind of Bell state uh, raised to the nth power is one way of putting it. Uh, as you go late into the evolution of the black hole, you have many such pairs. And then ultimately, uh, well, the simplest possibility is that the black hole just disappears. And so you're left only with the outside excitations. But that means that uh, we should take this state and, you know, if the inside excitations just aren't there, we should trace over them. Uh, we have no information about them. They're just gone. Uh, we should trace over them. And so we end up with a density matrix that looks something like this. The problem is, is if that's the fundamental description of evolution, as originally pointed out by Hawking, where we start out with some pure state, which say formed the black hole, but we end up with such a mixed state that looks like this, uh, that that violates quantum mechanics and specifically the property of unitarity. And so that is the beginning of, uh, of our trouble, uh, which we need to somehow uh, resolve. Uh, at this stage, I do want to point out that in describing this whole story, I've been treating the black hole as a subsystem. I've been saying, well, here you have inside excitations and they're separate from outside excitations. Okay, inside excitations and outside excitations uh, correspond to something like a factorization of the Hilbert space. Uh, and then I can trace over the inside excitations you know, when the black hole subsystem disappears, so to speak. Uh, so, so here we are making contact with that question. How do we think about localization of information in subsystems? Okay, so I'm guessing this is pretty familiar. Uh, this breakdown in quantum mechanics and unitary evolution can be quantified and it's quantified by the entropy of that density matrix. And so, or you can look at the entropy of the density matrix describing the stuff, the Hawking radiation outside the black hole. And as you make more and more 
of these outgoing excitations, that entropy just grows. And ultimately, by the time the black hole evaporates, uh, the entropy, the von Neumann entropy, is of order the original mass of the black hole in Planck units squared. So in principle, a very huge number at the evaporation time when the black hole finally disappears. Okay, so it looks like quantum mechanics is breaking down. That's what Hawking originally concluded. But this is what leads to our crisis in physics. Uh, and this really does appear to be a crisis in fundamental physics. And uh, the more you think about it, the more you realize that. Uh, and so let's try to start you know, describing possible resolutions. One obvious mundane resolution is maybe the uh, black hole evaporates down and it doesn't completely disappear. Maybe it leaves behind some microscopic black hole remnants uh, that contain the sort of missing information. So that was discussed early on uh, and uh, looks like it's really strongly ruled out, uh, basically because physics would be unstable to that kind of spectrum uh, of, uh, you know, having a large, in, in principle, unbounded number of uh, basically things like elementary particles, uh, all with, say, roughly Planckian masses. Well, you'd end up infinitely producing them in generic physical processes. So some more description of that is in these papers, there are different ways of seeing what's wrong with that, uh, but it really looks like that's ruled out. A second possibility is that there's some fundamental error we've made in our reasoning uh, and that somehow you don't end up with missing information at the end. But this has been you know, poked at over the years and it looks very unlikely that that is true uh, after 40 plus years of examining this question. Uh, there are still proposals along these lines, like that of soft hair, which I'm going to touch on. Uh, but, uh, you know, so far, it, no one has identified a clear error in reasoning. A third possibility, which starts to get more interesting, is an error in principles. And that is what is looking increasingly uh, likely, that we are missing some basic principle in this story. And that's very exciting, in fact, because that tells us that we have uh, you know, some new physical principles we need to discover associated with gravity. Uh, and black holes are playing a role as uh, guides in trying to figure out what those principles are. So that's why black holes and the problem of unitarity for black holes is so important and interesting in my mind. In fact, uh, you know, this kind of thing was suggested early on that we have made an error in uh, our principles. Uh, you know, Hawking first suggested this in 1976 when he said uh, that uh, the outcome of this whole story is breakdown of unitary quantum evolution, which is a basic principle of quantum mechanics. So that was the first proposal along these lines. The problem is, is that people investigated that idea more closely, specifically Banks, Peskin, and Susskind, <clears throat> And they found that this kind of breakdown of uh, unitary evolution is also connected with what appears to be massive breakdown of energy conservation in violent disagreement with experience. How violent disagreement? Well, you can argue that uh, if this is the resolution that the temperature everywhere should be something like the Planck temperature, and, you know, outrageously uh, ridiculous temperature. Okay, so this doesn't seem like such a good uh, out uh, or, or conclusion of this story. And uh, for that reason, many of us have come to the conclusion that we really should stick with quantum mechanics and not abandon that and look for a different error in principles underlying the explanation of what's going on. In fact, let's turn things around. And so uh, there's something that uh, I'll refer to as a black hole theorem. Uh, so if we assume that black holes can be treated as subsystems, and this is something I'm going to talk more about, uh, but if you do have something like a decomposition of the Hilbert space into that of a black hole in its environment, and if they build up entanglement, as I've described, uh, you know, which comes from the quantum field theory description that Hawking originally explained, and if they disappear at the end of evolution, so there are no remnants, since remnants look like they're crazy, and if the evolution must be unitary, uh, so that fundamentally nature is behaving quantum mechanically, quantum first, right? If those things are true, then there must be interactions that transfer information from the black hole. Uh, 
there isn't really any other way out. Uh, so that's the other thing that could be going on. Now, the problem is that any kinds of interactions that would transfer information from inside a black hole to outside apparently have to be non-local because locality doesn't permit you to transfer information from the interior of a black hole. So we seem to be violating the conventional locality principle of local quantum field theory, and not just on microscopic distance scales where you might expect that to happen, say at the Planck scale, but apparently on scales you know, comparable to the size of whatever black hole you're talking about, which can be quite macroscopic. So that seems like it should have some very potentially interesting consequences, and we'll explore those a little bit. Okay, so uh, first of all, though, if we're going to say there's something like a theorem along those lines, can we really think of black holes as being quantum subsystems? And that's one other possible way out. Well, uh, what could spoil thinking of a black hole as a quantum subsystem? Well, one thing that could spoil it is the long range nature of the gravitational field, the so-called gravitational dressing. When you create a particle, it also has a gravitational field that goes out to infinity. And something along these lines is very much what came into this discussion of soft hair uh, that uh, Hawking, Perry, and Strominger advocated you know, could be the way out. Another possibility is that somehow our picture of space-time just is you know, maybe even drastically wrong. Maybe there are big topology changing processes occurring. Uh, and that seems to be something that has been picked up again in just recent, uh, well, in the past year or so in this replica wormhole story, maybe there is an important contribution from such effects. And I've listed a few of the names and there are many, many more who are exploring this possibility. Another possibility is that there are other kinds of departures from semi-classical gravity, maybe fuzzballs or other stringy effects. And so, you know, of course, Mathur and, and many others who I can't mention here have been pursuing the fuzzball story. Uh, Silverstein and others have been uh, investigating possible other stringy effects. Uh, I'm not going to focus on these last two in the, except to say in the topology changing case, it's not really clear yet how to describe unitary amplitudes. Uh, you know, there's just a reproduction of, you know, what looks like the correct entropy curve, but uh, we don't yet understand the underlying unitary amplitudes. And in this case, it's at least for various reasons, hard to see a complete coherent story. But I am going to address this question of uh, whether the long range nature of the gravitational field, uh, gravitational dressing, uh, could sort of spoil us thinking about black holes as quantum subsystems and undermine this whole argument and you know, maybe provide a way up. And uh, that question is something that involves a very basic and important question about uh, gravity in this underlying mathematical structure that I was referring to earlier. So that's some motivation. So back to information localization. What is a quantum subsystem? How do we think about quantum subsystems? Uh, and in local quantum field theory, when you try to answer this question, that leads to an example for the kind of mathematical structure I've referred to, uh, the mathematical structure that's relevant just for local quantum field theory without gravity. So bear with me a little bit. Uh, first, how do we think about quantum subsystems when we have just a finite quantum system, or maybe a locally finite system like on a lattice? Well, the basic way of doing that is to assume that we have an additional structure on our Hilbert space where the Hilbert space actually factorizes into a product of uh, uh, Hilbert spaces. And in fact, that's sometimes taken, you know, it's so important, it's sometimes taken as a basic postulate uh, in quantum mechanics that you have such factorizations. For example, in a, one case is a uh, description of the postulates of quantum mechanics uh, that Zurich has given. Okay, so that's <clears throat> the case for finite or locally finite systems. Uh, but quantum theory itself is a little bit more difficult. We're gonna sort of step up the ladder from you know, finite systems, local quantum field theory, and then think about gravity. Uh, so you might say, maybe I should be able to do the same thing in local quantum field theory. Uh, I can take the Hilbert space and think about a region in a manifold and the uh, complement of the region U bar, and I can just find a factorization of the Hilbert space based on 
this decomposition uh, between you know, sort of stuff in you and stuff in the complement. <clears throat> well, it turns out that's not true. You can't find such a factorization. And that's basically due to, uh, in technical terms, the von Neumann type three property of the algebras associated with uh, local quantum field theory systems. Uh, or put more colloquially, the property of infinite entanglement. Uh, basically, you have in, infinite entanglement between the excitations in the region U and in its exterior associated with very short distance modes near the boundary. So this at least is not this, you know, a, a good simple way of describing uh, quantum subsystems in local quantum field theory. What do you do? Well, one common thing that's done is to instead assume that you have, uh, or instead work with the fact that you have commuting subalgebras uh, of the algebra of observables uh, associated with open regions. So associated with this open region U, you have a, an algebra of operators uh, that, so to speak, live in U. Uh, we can think of those as, say, taking a scalar field and integrating it against a compact support function with support in U. And uh, if we have two, say, space-like separated regions like that, uh, then the corresponding operators of this form uh, associated to the different regions commute. And in fact, that's how we encode uh, locality in a fundamental way in local quantum field theory. Uh, is in terms of this commutativity of observables at space-like separations. That, that's how locality is built in. These subalgebras, uh, put differently though, also define a notion of subsystems, of independent information, say in a region and in a region you know, somewhere space-like separated. <clears throat> and so this is associated in fact with a a mathematical structure, and this is more fully described in uh, Hogg's book on local quantum physics, uh, you can have inclusions, inclusion relations where you have one uh, neighborhood within another or intersection relations where you have one neighborhood intersecting another, and those are mirrored in the structure of these subalgebras. And so you end up with a net of these subalgebras <coughs> that uh, mirrors the uh, network of uh, open sets that describe the manifold. And that's how, in a quantum way, you describe the topological structure of the space time, along with the causal structure as well, because you have this notion of space like separation corresponding to commutativity. So that is the mathematical structure within quantum mechanics, this net of subalgebras uh, that. Uh, describes uh, both the notion of subsystems, uh, it's how you put in locality, and you know, it's where the manifold comes into the quantum description of the theory uh, at the, when you're talking about the quantum description in terms of the Hilbert space. So this is our example, our basic example of uh, the kind of mathematical structure that we might want to look for. And that's one of the reasons why I'm talking about subsystems. We see this example of uh, how that can be a very basic notion. So how do we think about subsystems in the context of quantum gravity? Uh, and let me emphasize that it's hard to imagine doing physics uh, without having a notion of subsystems. I just didn't understand something. Can you go back to your last transparency? Yes. Last yeah. Yeah. The net of sub-algebras, which is, you are saying that it's the same as topological structure of space-time plus causal. This causality now, I don't understand that, how will I separate them from topological structure of space-time in this case? Do you have any idea? Topological structure of space-time support to include everything. Now, when you say plus casual, that's a problem. I don't know how to distinguish between them. Uh, let me go uh, and get more into detail perhaps later. But uh, when I say topological structure, I just mean the uh, the basic topology of space time, uh, like we describe typically with manifolds in terms of open sets. You know, we put a topological structure on a space time. You know, using uh, you know, 
collections of open sets. Yes, uh, should, not include, a, should not it also include the casual? So why should I keep separate plus casual? Well, no, I'm just saying that uh, the subalgebras don't just have the uh, topological structure of the relationship to open sets, inclusions, intersections, and so on. Yeah. But you also have a notion of the causal structure because you have a notion of what is and isn't causally related. If two subalgebras commute, yes. they're associated with space but like separated. Particular equation, which you have written AU, AU commutator equal to zero, how do I incorporate yes. the causality into that? Or how does the equation changes when I bring in causality to into that equation? Well, th no, this is the state. This statement, okay, that say the, um, well, this here I'm referring to operators. But if you have two subgroups associated with two uh, regions U and U prime, yes. Uh, if I have those two subalgebras and if they commute, yeah, then that corresponds to those regions being space-like yeah. separated. So it's an yeah. extra piece of in information, and that's the Sorry, that's, that, that's, that's, that's extra piece of information is the causal relationship that they're space-like separated. Yes, but when we come to the, see the net of sub algebras, you are referring to sub algebras of that equation? AU referring to commutator yeah. between AU and AU prime equal to zero has sub algebras which can distinguish topological structure of space-time and causality. Are you referring to that? Well, yeah, so I, I am referring to this, but again, okay, so, so let, let's say what the map is. So open sets correspond yeah. to subalgebras, okay? Okay. And then the various you know, overlap relationships or inclusion relationships between open sets uh, also correspond to similar relationships between okay. subalgebras. Okay. Okay. And uh, so that's topological structure. And then, in addition, we have extra information because if two of the subalgebras commute, those correspond to uh, space-like separated open sets. So that's uh -huh. an extra piece of information about those open sets, the causal structure, roughly. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do we uh, think about subsystems in quantum gravity? Uh, you know, maybe I've convinced you we, we should try to figure that out. Uh, <clears throat> let me try to convince you even more strongly. So, uh, in fact, I claim it's hard to imagine doing physics without something like this. And in fact, Einstein really expressed this, I think, in this quote, uh, you know, some time ago. Uh, he's basically saying here, well, you can read the quote, it, or let's read it. It appears to be essential for this arrangement of the things introduced in physics that at a specific time, these things claim an existence independent of one another, insofar as these things lie in different parts of space. Without such an assumption of the mutually independent existence or being us of spatially distanced distant things, an assumption which originates in everyday thought, physical thought in the sense familiar to us would not be possible. Nor does one see how physical laws could be formulated and tested without such a clean separation. We need a way of separating things into something like subsystems to describe what we're doing in physics uh, is the basic statement here. So we need something like a localization of information and definition of subsystems uh, in order to do physics is the statement. <clears throat> but in quantum gravity, uh, we can't apparently do this just with classical geometry. We've got to go beyond and figure out how this works in the context of uh, you know, quantum gravity. OK, so uh, let's turn to hard problem, gravity. If there is a Hilbert space in gravitational physics, so if gravitational physics is quantum mechanical in the sense I've described, is there an analogous structure on it corresponding to quantum space-time, which reduces to the quantum field theory structure in the weak gravity correspondence limit, you know, when we're talking about 
say, solar system physics or laboratory physics at the LHC. And if there is such a mathematical structure, uh, what is it? Uh, let's give it a name, just so we have a name for it, gravitational substrate. Uh, what is this gravitational substrate uh, which describes the underlying mathematical structure of quantum space-time? And what I'm going to describe next are some modest uh, steps towards inferring this mathematical structure for quantum gravity. <clears throat> so really what I'm talking about here is just the perturbative tip of the iceberg, which we'll start to see. Uh, and you know, the rest is still uh, submerged under water. Um, the tip is a, uh, of course, of an iceberg is a reliable place to begin learning about the structure of icebergs uh, before diving underwater, okay? So that's the basic philosophy. Let's explore what we can uh, and try to see if we can learn anything about uh, the, what might be the more complete structure. Maybe your picture looks almost like an Indian map. <laughs> okay, well, I hadn't thought of that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry joke. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, in the perturbative description of gravity, let's start investigating these questions. So I said, uh, well, so let's think about a scalar field phi coupled to gravity uh, in the weak regime. Of course, in the you know, regime where we just turn off gravity, we set Newton's constant to zero, we reduce precisely to this structure I described before, where, for example, we have uh, the kinds of localized observables I described, uh, local subalgebras of those, and so on. But now let's consider turning on a little gravity uh, in an appropriate sense. At least let's you know, take Newton's constant to be non-zero and ask how this structure is modified. And the immediate conclusion is uh, that things have to be rather different because, for example, uh, phi of x, which was our basic observable here, is no longer a gauge invariant observable. It's not diff invariant. Under the gauge symmetries of gravity, uh, phi of x transforms in this fashion. Basically, it translates. Uh, here I've taken kappa to be essentially the square root of Newton's constant up to you know, familiar numbers. So for this reason, phi of x shouldn't be thought of as a physical quantum observable in the context of gravity. We've got to have something else if we want, you know, you need a gauge invariant notion if you're going to describe observables, physical observables, and so we've got to come up with something else. The problem is what I said before. Phi of x, if we think about it in terms of quantum fields, uh, creates a particle. But if you have gravity present, a particle is inseparable from its gravitational field. You just can't take them apart. And so the solution is, or at least one solution, or there's a different uh, way of approaching some of this, uh, is to take that into account and consider what are called dressed observables where you include the gravitational field. So instead of thinking about phi of x, we're going to think of, about a new set of, or you know, various operators, generically denoted capital phi of x, which create both the particle and the gravitational field going off to infinity. And we're going to study some properties of those operators. Okay, so here are some basics of that story. And for more uh, complete accounts, uh, you know, here are some of the papers where we've worked some of this out. So let's just work perturbatively about flat space. Uh, in perturbation H, uh, I pull out a power of kappa, the square root of Newton's constant. And in order kappa, the diffeomorphisms lead to a transformation for the metric perturbation, which is of a familiar form. Uh, delta H is well, this is the, so to speak, gauge transformation of the corresponding to diffeomorphisms. That's how it acts on, on H to this leading order in kappa. And what we'd like to do is find some observables which are uh, gauge invariant, unlike the original scalar field. Another way of putting that is that uh, in more technical terms, uh, we need to find operators that commute with the constraint operators. So the constraints in GR, of course, are the uh, zero mu components of Einstein's equations in, in one way of putting it. So we want to find operators that commute with the constraints because the constraints can be seen to generate the diffeomorphisms. 
So how do we solve that condition? Well, we found a, uh, a way or a family of ways of solving that is uh, to construct what we call a gravitational dressing, which is a, uh, say here, a vector field, which is a functional of the metric perturbation in function of the point x uh, or of a point x, uh, which satisfies a particular key condition, namely this gravitational dressing, this functional needs to transform under the diffeomorphisms, under this transformation law, uh, by a shift uh, by the diffeomorphism parameter. So that's the central condition. Uh, I'll explain how to solve that, con or you know, satisfy that condition, but if we do satisfy that condition, then you can easily see that uh, capital phi of x, which is little phi of x plus c, is diff invariant to this leading order in kappa. Uh, basically, this shift cancels the uh, shift you have in the uh, field phi when you perform a diffeomorphism on it. Okay, so that's how we're going to construct deleting perturbative order, diff invariant observables. <clears throat> so how do we find these gravitational dressings? Well, let's, let, uh, let's start out with a simple example. Let's consider a curve from the point x to infinity, maybe a straight line. And we can just take the gravitational perturbation and this combination of derivatives of it and this double integral of those. And it's quite, you know, it's just a couple of lines to show that this satisfies this key condition. Uh, basically, you're integrating the gravitational perturbation in a certain way off to infinity. So this is an example of addressing corresponding to what we'll call a gravitational line and was studied or in this form uh, appeared in uh, this paper here. Now, that's not the only possible gravitational dressing we can talk about. There are many possible solutions to this key condition. And roughly speaking, they correspond to the different allowed gravitational fields of a particle. A particle can have a gravitational field where you know, all the field lines, so to speak, go out to infinity in a thin tube, or you can have a Coulomb-like configuration or various other things. Uh, so another more physical configuration is, in fact, this kind of Coulomb dressing, uh, which gives you a, um, a V, uh, which you can get by taking the line V and averaging, averaging it over all directions. You take the spherical average and that gives you the Coulomb dressing, okay? So that's another example. And there are in fact, infinitely many more at this uh, leading perturbative level. Okay, so that's how we can construct uh, just working to leading order and perturbation theory, uh, diff invariant observables. This immediately shows us that we've got an issue with at least our earlier approach to defining subsystems when we were talking about field theory. Because whereas we could have two field operators in ordinary field theory that uh, commute at space-like separations, well now these operators have these gravitational lines attached and so they are not going to commute at space-like separations. The, uh, gravitational field part of the operator collide with one another and lead to non-commutativity. So just at this leading perturbative level, we're finding that gravity is different. Uh, we're finding a kind of gravitational non-commutativity or non-locality. It's not the standard kind of thing one talks about, you know, there are various discussions of non-commutative geometry. It's, it's different from that. Uh, it's something else. Since this is kind of interesting and important, you might ask, well, okay, typically how big is this non-commutativity? And so you can look at the non-relativistic limit and consider field operators that are creating, you know, two particles with masses M uh, and ask, you know, roughly how big are those non-vanishing commutators? And you see that the commutators uh, are parameterized basically by the gravitational potential of one of the particles. You can check that. Uh, quite straightforwardly. And that's actually in, uh, that matches up quite well with a previously sort of stated uh, bound on locality in the context of gravity uh, that had been stated some number of years before. Okay. So there is some fundamental modification of the notion of locality and gravity that we just discover by doing perturbative gravity. 
And again, the underlying issue is that if we create a particle here, okay, that has a physical effect over here. We just, we can't put a particle into the system without having its gravi consistently without having its gravitational field, and that's going to have a physical effect over here. And this also connects to this soft charge discussion of Strominger, uh, Perry, Hawking, and so on, because they were arguing, well, maybe this explains how information that you thought was here really can be discovered over here by measuring properties of the gravitational field through, say, the soft hair. So we need to look a little bit more carefully at that. And so that really is the question of uh, how do we localize information in gravity? In what sense is information localized in gravity? Well, as a warm up to this, since gravity is always harder, <laughs> let's talk about the case of quantum electrodynamics uh, and get some notion of how we might proceed. So QED has a similar story. Uh, let's think about a charge Q scalar field. And uh, that will, of course, not be gauge invariant in QED if it has a charge Q. But we can find a corresponding set of uh, gauge invariant objects by taking the charge Q scalar field phi and dressing it in a similar fashion. It's actually much simpler in QED. So we multiply by what's called a dressing to make it gauge invariant. And there are many examples of dressings in QED that work just like in gravity. So the simplest example is analogous to this gravitational line. Uh, it's called a Faraday line, where we take the gauge potential A and integrate it from the point X to infinity along a line. Uh, and so clearly, you know, when we put that together with phi and look at the transformation law, we have something gauge invariant. Okay, so here's a picture of some particles with Faraday lines attached. And you might say, okay, if I have, if I have those particles in the neighborhood, I can tell for example, there are vertical separations because I can just go out and measure where the Faraday lines are going off to infinity. So, you know, I have some way of detecting properties of the charge distribution in the neighborhood by measuring the Faraday lines outside the neighborhood. So I can detect aspects of the charge distribution. Information isn't localized. But the key point is that uh, we don't necessarily have to put the electric field or the dressing in that kind of configuration. We aren't required to correlate the electric field with the charge distribution in that way. There are many possible choices of the dressing that we could uh, choose. And so another choice, if we have some particles in a neighborhood U, is we could run the electric field lines to a common point y and then run them all out together to infinity. And then clearly if I make measurements of the electric field outside u, well, I can detect the total charge q because you know this field set of field lines carries that total charge so to speak. I can detect that total charge q, but I can't tell where the particles are from electric field measurements outside the neighborhood. So there exist choices of dressing uh, such that the electromagnetic observables in U bar, the complement of U, are insensitive to the charge distribution in U. Okay. And so we have a notion of how we localize information. We have independent information associated with the stuff in the neighborhood U. We have a notion of a subsystem, uh, but it's not based any longer on commuting operators. Uh, you know, still you know, we have this dressing running off to infinity, so it's not really commuting operators that we're talking about. It's a little bit more like what we were talking about in the case of finite quantum systems, something like a decomposition of the Hilbert space. We have a set of states in here, uh, which can't be distinguished out here. But I said that was problematic even in local quantum field theory. So, you know, how do we get around that? Can we fix that? Well, uh, so let's talk about local quantum field theory just before we have quantum gra or quantum electrodynamics or gravity uh, and go back and see if there's some way of doing something like characterization of the Hilbert space. So I said if you have a neighborhood and its complement that we can't factorize the Hilbert space into a corresponding product uh, associated with the neighborhood and the complement because of this infinite entanglement. 
But there's something like this that we can do, and that is, in here it's a little technical, uh, but uh, we can construct something called the split vacuum. That's a new state, which isn't the vacuum any longer. It's associated with an extension of the neighborhood out by an amount epsilon. So we have a new neighborhood u sub epsilon, which is the extended neighborhood u and its complement, okay? And associated with that, we have this state uh, and construction of it is described in Hogg. It goes back into the earlier algebraic quantum field theory literature. And this state does something special. It does something almost like giving you a product. And specifically, if we have an operator in U or in the subalgebra cor corresponding to U and an operator in the complement of the bigger neighborhood, so outside U epsilon, uh, and if we look at the product of those two operators in this split vacuum, then that product factorizes. In other words, this tells you these two operators are not correlated any longer. Uh, so this split vacuum disentangles the degrees of freedom in U from the degrees of freedom in the complement of U epsilon. Uh, it gets rid of the correlation we had in the ordinary vacuum. And so, uh, for example, if we can consider states where we act on the split vacuum with uh, one operator or a different operator uh, associated with U, and those states will be indistinguish indistinguishable uh, by making measurements outside of U epsilon. Okay, so we can act with one or the other, and because of this property, observables outside of u epsilon can't tell the difference between those states. So this gives us a way of having something like a localized qubit, okay, one state or the other, associated with a neighborhood for which you can't tell the difference outside the bigger neighborhood, a localized qubit. And so this is a way also of thinking about localized quantum information. <clears throat> and the mathematical structure is not that we have a factorization of the Hilbert space, but that we have, uh, it turns out, an embedding of the product of Hilbert spaces, one associated with U, one associated with the complement of U epsilon, with U bar epsilon. Uh, we have an embedding of the product into the bigger Hilbert space. So that's a related structure, but it's not quite as strong as having an actual factorization. So that's one other way of thinking about subsystems in local quantum field theory. And that's more similar to what we actually uh, were doing when we were thinking about dressing. Any questions on that? Okay. So now- uh, Excuse me. Uh, could, could you give, give us a, um, like a, a scratch of how is that uh, vacuum state constructed and is it some kind of GNS construction? Uh, the construction, it's actually interesting. It's, well, okay, it takes some penetrating the algebraic quantum field theory literature to understand what they're saying on this, but uh, you know, the usual proof that it exists is not actually a constructive proof. Uh, namely, uh, you know, if you have a neighborhood, they can't necessarily tell you how to constructively uh, uh, sort of build this state, uh, but they can show that it exists. Uh, at least that's my understanding of it. And uh, so, you know, that's something that it would be nice to understand a little bit better, actually. But in any case, uh, there is a, a you know, good argument that these states exist. And oh, just one other thing about them, you know, for example, if you think about, say, a free theory or whatever, there, it's some bogle yuboff transformation of the ordinary vacuum. And so it's basically something where, you know, in the ordinary vacuum, you have uh, this infinite entanglement between the excitations in this region and in the complement, right? And so uh, basically that bogle yuboff transformation is disentangling the excitations in this region and outside the bigger region uh, by uh, you know, sort of doing something in this buffer region uh, between the two neighborhoods. Okay, so it's sort of creating, disentangling the excitations at the price of introducing some extra energy. That's a rough idea of what's going on. 
when you say the usual vacuum is the, which the one which is given by the Poincare symmetry. Yeah, yeah. Say so if you're thinking, just think about the simplest possible thing: a scalar field in flat Minkowski space, and just think about the standard vacuum for that. And the standard vacuum for that will have an infinite entanglement between the excitations in U and the excitations in U bar that you see. Say if you uh, think about it in the well, a simple example of this is just think about Rindler space, which is dividing the world just into two halves, and you have infinite entanglement between the two halves uh, in the Minkowski vacuum. So that's the standard vacuum. And so the split vacuum is, uh, at least in that context, a bogo yuboff transformation of that standard vacuum uh, that's sort of disentangling uh, the excitations uh, by uh, you know, it's sort of, well, disentangling specifically the entanglement in this sort of buffer region. So, uh, Thank you. But yeah, it'd be nice to have a, a, a more complete description of that. So. Uh, sorry, Steve, I didn't follow actually. How do I distinguish between your this disentangled vacuum, which you call U epsilon, compared to the ordinary vacuum that we define for field theory. So what are the properties of creation and annihilation operator change from the ordinary vacuum, which you write in the right hand side, compared to this uh, split vacuum? Um, for example, a creation operator, I would have defined uh, an annihilation operator acting on ordinary vacuum giving me zero, a creation operator giving me a one particle state. But yeah. when I compared with your split vacuum, is there a possibility for me to distinguish whether it is a zero particle state, one particle state, n particle state? Yeah, so let me give you a simple uh, example. I won't explain all of the relationships here, but as, as just pointed out, the ordinary vacuum yeah. is of course annihilated by all the annihilation operators. Exactly, yeah. Okay, this vacuum uh, is not, you know, it has some extra excitations on it. Uh, we, again, we can think of those as being created by a bogle yuboff transformation. And so this is not annihilated by all of the annihilation operators. Okay, and so it's go there are gonna be some relationships uh, associated with that, uh, but that's the, a central difference. Okay. Another central difference, and this is maybe more crucial, is that in the ordinary vacuum, you don't have this property here. If you look at an operator here and an operator here, you know, just think of phi of x and phi of y at space-like separation in two different neighborhoods in the ordinary vacuum. Well, in a massive theory, of course, they're, they're or in a massive theory, but think about a massive theory, they're correlated. Uh, and so this two-point function does not vanish even at space-like separations. It may fall off exponentially, but it doesn't vanish. Here, however, in the split vacuum, uh, those correlations do vanish. And that's a key point. But what I wanted to know is that in this split vacuum, do I, can I define a one-particle state, n-particle state, etc.? Well, the split vacuum already, in some sense, has excitations present. So it's not as clean in that sense. It's, it, it is, um, uh, yeah, there's not as, well, it already, it has some collection of excitations present. And so it's not sort of a zero particle state to begin with. The excitations can be in principle infinite in number. Say again. The excitations can be, for example, what you say U epsilon, it can be also a, infinite number of excited particles in that state. Yeah, there. I think it actually in general, it is going to be an infinite number of, or a superposition of states with infinite numbers of excitations because you have to disentangle the infinite, the infinite entanglement between the two regions. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, so, Fock, Fock representation with respect to the usual vacuum and the uh, um, and the representation of the, the of the of, of this algebra with uh, with respect to this vacuum are in equivalent representations. The um, 
the properties of the field algebra have not changed. We're just considering a different vacuum, that's all. It's a Bogle-Yubov transformation of the original vacuum. In, yeah, in the, but that uh, induces uh, 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 when, let's say something like uh, like a GNS, uh, when you go GNS with, with that vacuum state, you have a representation of the algebra. Uh, my question is, if, if they are they unitarily equivalent? Uh, let's see. Um, I think so, but well, yeah, we let's save that one. That's a more technical question. Let's save that for later. Okay. But it, well, yeah, let's save that one for later. Okay, so um, how do we extend this in the case where we have an electromagnetic field present? Uh, and so with an electromagnetic field present, uh, well, we could have done the same kind of thing with the underlying, say, scalar field excitations, but now we've got these electric field lines, basically, that are always attached to such excitations. But we can always run the field lines out you know, along, a, say, some common line, like I was describing. Uh, so um, when we think about this in terms of the Hilbert space, we can have different kinds of excitations in here, uh, but associated with any set of excitations in the region U, well, we can always measure the total charge, okay? But we can arrange things so that's all we can measure is the total charge. So we've got an extra label on our Hilbert spaces, which is that total charge. Uh, we can make a measurement outside, you know, out near infinity, in fact. We can make a measurement which uh, distinguishes the total charge. Uh, and so we're going to have basically a label on this set of Hilbert space inclusions, which is that total charge. And so this is uh, the beginning of uh, the construction of what we could call an electromagnetic splitting. It's similar to the split vacuum construction, uh, but now in the context of electromagnetism, uh, built on top of the split vacuum U epsilon. Uh, and so we have these inclusions of the products of Hilbert spaces uh, labeled by the total charge. And moreover, we could think about a network of such electromagnetic splittings, uh, and that corresponds to the mathematical uh, subsystem structure for QED, if you, we have such a network. And uh, this gives us a notion of how we can localize quantum information in QED. Okay, it gives us a basic idea for how we can do that. I'm not going to go into all the details, but I, I hope you can at least understand the basic approach here. But what we'd like to do next is ask, you know, can something like this work in gravity? And so I'm going to give you the leading order construction, which is analogous to this in gravity. So let's suppose we have some collection of excitations in a region, uh, and now we're talking about gravi the gravitational field. So I said there are various kinds of dressings. We could go out along a straight line, or we could do other things. And in fact, let me first show you how you can uh, bring all the gravitational field lines to a common point and run it out to infinity. So you can't uh, measure the details of the uh, distribution uh, inside the neighborhood. So the way you do that is as follows. So you take the gravitational line expression I had earlier and just generalize it to, you know, write it as in, well, there's an expression where you have a finite version of that where you integrate from y to x. So we can use that expression basically to introduce the gravitational field lines between two points. And then, of course, if we take one of the points off to infinity, that's the expression we had before, and that's what gives this piece of the gravitational dressing. And so if you combine these two things, uh, you know, the gravitational dressing from x to y plus the gravitational dressing from y to infinity, uh, then you can come up with something that satisfies this key relationship I mentioned. Uh, but there's an extra little funny looking term here that's needed uh, involving some derivatives that you know, just kind of looks strange. What could that be? Well, we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, but we've satisfied this relationship. So this is another way of creating a diffeomorphism invariant uh, associated with these uh, excitations in this neighborhood. 
Uh, and in fact, we could have done this not just with a gravitational line going out to infinity, but we could have had the Coulomb field going out to infinity from this point Y or any other, you know, standard, what we want to call standard gravitational field, which satisfies this basic condition, okay? Didn't have to be a gravitational line. Okay, so we can do something like what I described, which is run all the field lines together so you can only learn limited information about the configuration outside the neighborhood. Let's look at this a little bit more closely and see what information we can learn. Okay, so first of all, uh, we're going to build this perturbatively on top of the split vacuum. And so uh, we're going to generalize our field operator, uh, which we dressed. Uh, so you can take a more general operator in the underlying quantum field theory and dress it, turn it into a dressed version by basically at this leading order, adding this uh, commutator of the stress tensor with the operator integrated against the dressing. That's what generalizes this expression. Again, leading order in kappa. We can likewise describe, say, a state, which is gotten by acting with an operator on a split vacuum. And that can be dressed, again, by acting with this integral of the dressing against the stress tensor. And then, uh, okay, so if we have, say, uh, dressed operators acting on the split vacuum in this um, neighborhood uh, or, or consider a state where we, well, that, that's the kind of state we're talking about here. If you have uh, such excitations in this neighborhood with this kind of dressing, you can ask, what can I measure outside the neighborhood if I measure the gravitational field? What can I detect? What properties of that configuration? Well, let's look at the commutator of H, the gravitational gravitational field operator uh, or gravitational perturbation with the dressed operator A. And that commutator, with a little bit of effort you can show, is just related to the commutator of the total Poincaré charges, P and M, with the original operator A that I was dressing. And then those basically times expressions which just depend on uh, the point that I'm using. Uh, and the point that I've, or sorry, the point that I'm measuring at, and the choice of this standard gravitational field, whether it was a line dressing or a Coulomb dressing or what have you. Okay, so put differently, the measurements of H outside the, in the, outside the bigger neighborhood only detect the total Poincaré charges of the operator inside the neighborhood. Total Poincaré charges being the momenta and angular momentum. So two comments. One is, this is like what we found for electromagnetism, where we can only detect the total charge outside, but in gravity, the relevant charges are the Poincaré charges, P and M mu nu. Secondly, that mysterious term I was describing involving the derivatives in the dressing that look kind of funny is exactly what's responsible for the term here that involves the angular momentum. So now it starts to look quite, uh, well, not mysterious, but it had an important role to play. And so likewise, if we look at some product of uh, gravitational field operators outside the neighborhood and look at, say, the expectation value of that product in, or even matrix elements between different dress states, these will depend on matrix elements of the products of uh, the total moment, sorry, total Poincaré charges, and on the chosen standard dressing whatever we took it to be outside, uh, or that goes outside the neighborhood. So this is a leading order in kappa statement. So this has been a little bit uh, technical, but uh, let's si simply uh, restate the conclusion. I can have some matter distribution in the neighborhood, uh, and I can find a gravitational dressing of that such that measurements outside the neighborhood only depend on the total Poincaré charges uh, of the stuff inside the neighborhood, along with whatever choice of standard dressing I made, Coulomb or, or whatever. Uh, and you don't register other features of the matter distribution uh, at all uh, in this leading perturbative order. So this includes, for example, you know, the story of measurement of soft charges, by the way, the soft charges don't give you any extra information about what's in the matter distribution in the neighborhood. So now we 
we have a way of thinking about uh, localized quantum information, even in the presence of long-range gravitational fields. We've got a notion of localization of quantum information in uh, gravity by this construction. So what's the corresponding mathematical structure on the Hilbert space? Well, we're only working at leading order and uh, you know, haven't worked out all of the, you know, the full story yet, but we have something like the structure we had in electromagnetism. You can think about a maximal set of uh, commuting point Poincaré charges, and those should label the different, those should now be the labels on the Hilbert spaces uh, that uh, now don't give you a factorization, but there's an inclusion of products of Hilbert spaces into the bigger Hilbert space, like in the electromagnetic case, so you could refer to this as a gravitational splitting. And this suggests that a way of describing the quantum structure of, uh, you know, space-time in some sense, is that you have such a network of Hilbert space embeddings into the bigger Hilbert space, and that replaces the manifold structure of quantum field theory. That's sort of the more fundamental thing uh, when you're talking about gravity. That's how we start getting at quantum space-time. That should, should be the structure on the basic underlying object, which is the Hilbert space. So put differently, these Hilbert space embeddings replace the open sets, uh, apparently, or at least this is one way of describing something that replaces the open sets. Uh, and uh, so that's starting to get at our basic mathematical structure. A minimum quantum gravity needs to reproduce this structure in the weak limit. And so in fact, that is just the perturbative tip of the iceberg. <coughs> and uh, you know, we'd of course like to go further. So there are various questions here and I'm not going to say a lot more about this structure, but you know, is there a simpler way of describing this underlying mathematical structure? Uh, what is the full higher order extension, or more importantly, what does the non-perturbative extension of this look like? And just a few words about that, uh, you know, there are going to be some important new things that come into it then, because uh, when you talk about the strong field behavior of gravity, that has some rather novel features. If I try to put a large number of excitations in a neighborhood with a large amount of energy, well, I know that ultimately the gravitational field, uh, the strong gravitational field is going to extend outside that neighborhood. So if I put, you know, basically too much energy into a neighborhood, well, ultimately the Schwarzschild radius of corresponding to that energy is going to go outside the radius of the neighborhood. And so, you know, the strong field is going to extend outside and in a complete quantum or non-perturbative description, I'm going to have to account for that in the structure. This in particular tells us not all naive quantum field theory states you could put in that neighborhood are allowed. Uh, this is like the kind of thing one talks about in, you know, when people talk about holographic bounds, but notice this is an area uh, versus energy kind of bound, not area versus information kind of bound. If you put too much energy in a region, uh, then you have to, uh, you have an important modification to the gravitational dynamics that extends outside the region. <clears throat> and there are going to be related restrictions on the inclusion maps. If you have two nearby neighborhoods and the combined energy in the two nearby neighborhoods exceed this kind of bound, you're also going to have to have some important modification. And also associated with this uh, is presumably the statement that there's a smallest Hilbert space that you can't have uh, Hilbert spaces, so to speak, associated with regions smaller than the Planck distance. Uh, so these are all things that should come into the more complete story. We've only looked at the perturbative tip of the iceberg, but we expect these to be features of the uh, rest of the iceberg, uh, if we can figure out how that all works. So there's a little more discussion in this paper here, but that's really all I can give now. Uh, I do want to mention, uh, you know, of course, everyone's familiar, or well, a lot of you here, I'm guessing, are familiar with uh, holography. Uh, and there's a connection between this story and some of the things that are said about holography. Obviously, there are some common themes here. Uh, and so let me just very briefly uh, tell you about uh, some things that are more completely treated in this paper with uh, Alex Kinsella, who's a UCSB student. Uh, 
So what is this kind of holography? Well, that's the notion that, say, in anti-de Sitter space, we have a map between the Hilbert space or the theory and the bulk of anti-de Sitter space and a Hilbert space uh, in theory on its boundary. And a key question for ADS CFT uh, is what is this map? How do you map from observables in the bulk to observables on the boundary or between the two Hilbert spaces? Uh, that's something that there's been a lot of thought given to, and we still don't have a complete description of that map. What I'm saying, uh, I think, is related to that because the best candidate explanation for how you construct that map was given by Merrill uh, originally back in 2008 and in a series of papers, also Jacobson has developed these ideas and so on. And specifically, the gravitational constraints play a key role. Namely, a way of thinking about constructing that map is you start with an observable here or an operator here, you can evolve it using the equations of motion up until it hits the boundary. But then we can use the statement that in gravity, uh, the Hamiltonian is a surface term, uh, lives on the boundary to uh, evolve that operator back to uh, an operator at equal times. That's the basic thread of the argument. I don't have time to give the complete description. But the key point is this statement that the, that the Hamiltonian is a surface term is only true if the constraints are solved. Okay, so again, these are the constraints. We've seen those before. And remember, that's exactly the problem we've been solving is that of finding operators that commute with the constraints or solve the constraints. That's what the dressing does, the gravitational dressings. So in fact, the dressing is related to this construction of the proposed holographic uh, map. Uh, now, of course, to relate the op an operator up here uh, where it hits the boundary back to an equal time operator back here, a large translation is needed. So we need not just the perturbative dressing at leading order and kappa I've described, but probably really all orders and quite likely non-perturbatively uh, corresponding to you know, basically solving the non-perturbative bulk evolution. So you need to know something about apparently the non-perturbative bulk evolution to completely construct the map. If you have that, possibly you can construct this holographic map, but that kind of refocuses what the underlying problem is. Let me put it that way. And there are still some questions that remain about the construction of that map, uh, including the question regarding its relationship to this whole subsystem structure. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say, <clears throat> giving you uh, some notion of the basic uh, mathematical structure of quantum gravity. Uh, but let me turn back to our original problem of black holes in the remaining, I see, uh, well, maybe 20 minutes or something. It probably won't take me that long. Okay, so black holes. Uh, we've given a rather long and interesting story, which is related possibly to the underlying mathematical structure of quantum gravity about uh, how to think about subsystem, subsystems and so on. Uh, in the context of black holes, uh, so what we've done is given an initial check, which, and there are further checks on this, uh, where we've been able to gain some confidence that at least in some approximation, we can think of black holes as, as, as subsystems. You can think of um, something like a Hilbert space decomposition. Here, I'll just put an approximately uh, or uh, similar to sign uh, uh, that you, know, you can think of the Hilbert space where you have a black hole as being something like a product between the black hole Hilbert space and the environment Hilbert space. And we know now it's more, a little more complicated than that, but there's some structure like that. So from the black hole theorem I described, there should be interactions that transfer information or entanglement out of black hole if you want to have quantum mechanics hold and evolution be unitary. And so the question is, what do these interactions look like and could they have observational consequences? So I'm briefly going to summarize the story of what I call nonviolent unitarization, uh, which uh, sort of the original paper on this following up various other papers uh, going in this direction. Uh, the original paper was this one and a recent summary was uh, from last year in this other paper. So postulates for quantum gravity. We said one set of postulates for quantum or one
articulate for Congress that the principles of quantum mechanics and we've discussed that. We've also said that you need some additional mathematical structure, uh, a notion of subsystems, and we've talked about at least perturbatively how to describe that. It's a little subtle, but you have something like a factorization of Hilbert spaces. And then, of course, we've also talked about this third postulate that we have a notion of a correspondence principle that whatever our fundamental structure for is for quantum gravity plus you know other kinds of fields that should match on to good old local quantum field theory plus GR in at least weak gravity regimes. Uh, and so that seems like a very important principle as well. We're looking for a minimal departure, in fact, uh, you might think, from local quantum field theory plus GR. Let's apply these postulates to black holes. OK, so uh, postulate two, subsystem, says we have a notion of a black hole and in its environment as being subsystems is a, of a bigger system. Let's try to parameterize that a little bit more. So if we want a state describing a black hole in its environment, that's going to have you know, some labels associated with the excitations inside the black hole. Let's call them K. Total mass of the black hole, that's like this extra label of the Poincaré charges. That's a simple example of that. Uh, and then for the state outside the black hole, well, you know, it's the states of approximately, to a good approximation, local quantum fields outside the black hole. That's what we see when we look out at you know, regimes outside black holes, uh, at least far outside black holes, something that looks very much like local quantum field theory. And then we're talking about the Schrodinger picture, so we'll evolve the state in time t. OK, uh, so <clears throat> that's a description of the state. And of course, we expect there to be a large number of black hole states as well. That'll play a role soon. OK, now next, uh, postulate one, quantum mechanics, says this whole thing should evolve in a unitary fashion. And in particular, we've said that uh, that means information must, in some sense, transfer out. So how do we describe the evolution? Well, we can think of giving the in, it in an infinitesimal form in terms of a Hamiltonian, which has a black hole piece, an environment piece, and some coupling between the two, which I'll call H sub i. And so, of course, for example, if we were just talking about local quantum field theory evolution, a la Hawking, we could describe it this way. But the problem is that has the wrong Hamiltonian, because in the end, we know that leads to the non-unitary story. So the question is how that gets modified. So the environment part, we expect to look like the evolution of good old local quantum field theory. The black hole part of the Hamiltonian, well, that's kind of unknown. It might involve dynamics down near this would-be singularity and so on. So I'm going to remain agnostic about that. But a key thing we need to think about is what transfers information out of the black hole. Uh, and that, again, must be transferred out by postulate one unitarity. Uh, so let's try to describe the um, interaction part of the Hamiltonian, which trans basically transfers quantum information from the internal state of the black hole to the surrounding excitations. So I'm going to try to give an effective description of uh, what kind of Hamiltonian that could be. I'm just going to parameterize our ignorance. And the simplest way of describing information transfer between two systems, two subsystems, is to have an operator, a Hamiltonian term uh, that has operators that act on one subsystem. Let's call those lambda sub a. Uh, if we have a finite number of black hole states, we could think of those as being you know, built up from the UN generators, uh, which are the basic matrices acting between those states. Here's an example. And then times an op some operator acting on the environment. Again, the environment outside, well outside the black hole is described uh, approximately in terms of local quantum fields, so some local quantum field operator. And we could just sum over all such things. So we integrate over positions of the operator outside, sum over possible uh, operators inside, et cetera, and some coefficients here, which I'll call G, A, B of X. Okay, so that's just the general thing that is sort of the simplest thing it could be, some to transfer information from the black hole to the exterior. Now I'm going to introduce one further postulate, uh, which is a postulate of universality. Uh, and that is the statement that new effects beyond local quantum field theory, new quantum gravity effects, should couple universally to matter and gauge fields. And there are various motivations for that. 
gravity has a very universal character, as we know, via the equivalence principle. There are also various Gedanken experiments you can consider called uh, involving black hole mining, where you do something like take a black hole and say thread it with a cosmic string and uh, ask how that changes the rate of evaporation and the rate of information transfer. Uh, so those Gedanken experiments motivate this postulate, uh, and also the very beautiful properties of black hole thermodynamics motivate this. Uh, and so what is this universality postulate? It's, again, this postulate that the new effects couple universally. So instead of just some old operator here, how can we achieve that? Well, we can achieve that if the coupling between the black hole and internal, black hole internal states and the exterior is universally to all fields through the stress tensor. And so let's explore that uh, possibility, which again, is the simplest way of realizing something universal. If that's the case, then this collection of coefficients and then operators that act on the black hole Hilbert space can be thought of as basically a black hole state dependent metric perturbation. The thing that couples to the stress tensor is something like a metric, but it's a state dependent metric because it depends on the black hole state. Okay, there are various other constraints on these couplings. Uh, <clears throat> so first, uh, three, the correspondence principle says that this uh, operator should be localized near the black hole. We don't want something that's transferring information to the next galaxy. We don't need that. That's a more extreme violation of local quantum field theory or departure from local quantum field theory. On the other hand, if we have something that's too closely localized near the black hole, then we'll end up describing something that in the end produces very high energy excitations near the black hole. And in fact, we'll end up with the firewall story that was discussed widely a few years ago. Uh, so in fact, there, there's sort of a just right scale for these excitations, something comparable to the size of the black hole. So, or for these couplings, these coupling functions, uh, if you want something that is matching well to local quantum field theory respects correspondence, then uh, the typical scales here should be of order the black hole size or, or maybe some parametric scale that's some power of the black hole size, but something that grows with the black hole size. Uh, and also, you know, you should have transitions uh, between black hole states that differ by an energy of order one over R, the typical energy of a Hawking quantum. Uh, other, you know, if you had consider the alternative transitions, which corresponded to, say, emitting Planck energy particles, that's going to look very uh, different outside the black hole, very big departure from the Hawking story and from local quantum field theory. So correspondence is one guide. And another important guide is this interaction has a job to do. And that is it needs to save unitarity. So we had this curve where the von Neumann entropy was going up and up and up. And in the end, uh, when the black hole evaporated, it reached this large value. And this um, interaction has to be big enough to turn that curve over and make the information come back out. Roughly speaking, you need an information flow, which is of order one qubit per mm -hmm. light crossing time coming out it, of the black uh, hole. The time scale when it uh, start turning, is it the page time? That's a very good question. Uh, it has to be probably something, at least as it, when it turns on, it has to be something that's at least the scrambling time or the, uh, you know, the R log R time scale. Yeah. And it has to, and it needs to turn on before the page time. Okay. But then the question is, is if this involves some new quantum structure of space time, does it really take that long to turn on? Or is it more realistic for it actually to be present all along? Mm -hmm. And it just you know, plays an increasingly important role at the page time. So that's something where we don't know the answer, but I think it's perfectly plausible that if there are such new interactions present, they are important not just at the page time, but they, they are, they're not just effective at the page time, but they actually play a role throughout the evolution of the okay. black hole. That's interesting. It could be. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so in any case, you know, apparently in this story, one needs to have such interactions. There is a question about when they turn on, but plausibly, if it put differently, if they involve something structural with our description of quantum space time, well, maybe they should be present from the beginning. 
Okay, so we need them to do this job. They have to be big enough to do that. So here's one way of achieving that. If the expectation value of these um, effective metric perturbations in the typical quantum state of the black hole, uh, if, if those are of order one, and again, the relevant distance and time scales are of order of the event horizon size, uh, then that clearly is enough to transfer um, you know, the right amount of information out of the black hole. If there are effectively strong fluctuations in the metric of a black hole in the vicinity of the would-be horizon. Uh, that is potentially interesting because, uh, you know, we're now looking at black holes uh, through electromagnetic observations uh, with Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, so far, just M87, Sagittarius A star we hope is coming soon. Uh, for those who haven't followed the story, of course, well, now I think most people have, but Event Horizon Telescope is basically a telescope which networks together radio telescopes to produce a, a system with the size of the Earth, okay, uh, and uh, <clears throat> has at least taken, roughly speaking, a snapshot of M87. Uh, if you had, you know, large perturbations like this, they could lead to important departures. And here's a little movie uh, that Demetrius Saltis, who uh, has been the project scientist for EHT, uh, uh, that he put together based on some work uh, we did just trying to parameterize, you know, sort of a, an onsets for these perturbations, you can get quite dramatic effects on the shadow. And in fact, probably this extreme of a situation is actually ruled out. Uh, and, oh, let me go back. Uh, that extreme of a situation is probably ruled out, but uh, you can start constraining this kind of scenario and seeing whether it's uh, even possible or not, especially with longer time scale observations of black holes via EHT. Okay, so that's interesting. Uh, what do you mean by order one perturbation? Is the coupling is of the order of one? Uh, what I mean is this quantity is of order one. So I said this is like a perturbation in the metric. Uh -huh. And so that's a dimensionless thing. The metric is dimensionless. Yes, yes. Uh, at least in the way I've set up the, the scaling dimension. Yeah. So it's that this, you know, expectation value of this thing is of order one. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, you know, that would be, of course, very interesting and exciting to see some, you know, new quantum phenomena directly via EHT. But, uh, you know, let's try to be sober about this and ask the question uh, whether we really need to have excitations that large in order to save unitarity, to save quantum mechanics. And so the question really is how big the how big the couplings have to be. Uh, this is an example of a general problem in quantum information theory. If we have two subsystems and they're coupled via an interaction HI, and we want to have that transfer a certain amount of information between the two subsystems, well, how big do the couplings have to be? There's a longer analysis of this. Uh, this basic problem, you know, I sort of set up and discussed here. Um, there's a longer story here, but the bottom line is in this context, it looks like a typical size for metric perturbations, uh, which is namely typical size for their matrix element between black hole states, uh, which is small, exponentially small in the black hole entropy, apparently suffices. And that might at first sight seem strange. How could something that is a tiny interaction, exponentially small, transfer an order one amount of information per light crossing time? <clears throat> well, there's an argument for how it could work that is similar to, uh, or based on basically Fermi's golden rule. Let's ask, you know, how, what's the transition rate that a given coupling can induce? If you think of a black hole as being something like an atom, you're inducing transitions uh, through its coupling to the external fields. You know, how do you get an order one transition rate? Well, Fermi's golden rule, it's two pi times the density of final states times the uh, matrix element squared of the Hamiltonian. So I just said the matrix element squared of the Hamiltonian is exponentially small. How can this be of order unity? Well, it can be of order unity if the density of final states is exponentially big. And it just so happens that the, ex that the density of final states for a black hole, you know, it includes the black hole final states, is exponentially big. Uh, <coughs> that's the 
you know, from relation or familiar story we have where we expect a black hole to have a very large number of internal quantum states. So uh, bottom line is you apparently can accomplish this with relatively weak uh, couplings of this form. Now you might say that's less interesting because it means we won't see anything at EHT ultimately, uh, and quite possibly true, but uh, it's, it may still be interesting. Okay, so, but first of all, what have we learned? Well, while the effects can potentially be weak and still have the relevant effect, uh, we've learned if this story is true that black holes are intrinsically quantum objects and not just you know down near the singularity but out to event horizon scales. That seems to be a conclusion uh, that we you know, we seem to have to accept, uh, you know, I've given one version of how that could happen, and there are e other even more radical proposals for how that could happen, which, you know, say, you know, if it is one of these other stories that people talk about, like, I, I don't know, fuzzballs or ER equals EPR or replica wormholes or whatever, all of those seem to involve modifications out to the event horizon scale. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, back to observation, it turns out that the same kind of argument I've just given about the effect of the couplings uh, can be extended to think about the situation, say, if you have, say, a gravitational wave or some other wave scattering off of a black hole, you can get order one modifications to the, the scattering amplitudes uh, for that kind of process uh, for the uh, long wavelength modes, the modes with a comparable wavelength to, to R. And so even the weak scenario I've just described uh, could have, it appears, gravitational wave signatures uh, through modifying the propagation of gravitational waves in the vicinity of you know, the two individual black holes, which are in spiraling. Uh, and so potentially there could be tests uh, through LIGO, Virgo, uh, or LISA, uh, or you know, other gravitational wave uh, <coughs> Uh, facilities. And, uh, you know, that's a question that's still being explored, but at least there's an argument in principle that you can get things of the right size. Okay, so uh, I've given a basic outline of the scenario uh, further, and I've tried to convince you, it, it sort of is an outcome of a certain set of assumptions, uh, and further study of it is in progress. Uh, but, you know, of course, coming back to the original question, the quantum structure of gravity, it's very important to ask, what is this telling us about the underlying dynamics of quantum gravity? And that's something we'd ultimately like to get at. So finally, to conclude and summarize, uh, trying to quantize geometry has led to multiple difficulties. I think everyone can appreciate. Uh, originally, non-renormalizability was the primary one that we saw, but we've grown to appreciate that non-unitarity may be even more profound and fundamental. I've suggested that we begin with quantum mechanics uh, instead of quantizing geometry. We start with quantum, mechan quantum mechanics, start with Hilbert space, and ask what mathematical structure on Hilbert space is needed to approximately recover local quantum field theory plus geometry. And so this is more of what I call a quantum first approach. Uh, and so there, you know, you can ask what, you know, what this structure has to do. And I've argued that a key thing it has to do is give us some notion of this Einstein separability. We need some mathematical implementation of this kind of subsystem structure or this separateness uh, in order to do physics. Separation, say, between observer and observed is part of that as well. And so when you try, try to start describing that, you start seeing uh, in gravity a an emergence of uh, a kind of quantum replacement for space-time, uh, which, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, I'll call for now a, a gravitational substrate on the Hilbert space H. And the question is, you know, what fundamentally is that? So already we've seen important constraints on this in perturbative gravity, uh, you know, through this notion that even at weak fields, we should match onto the familiar story. Through correspondence, we've seen that you know, we don't have a precise tensor factorization. We don't describe it necessarily in terms of local subalgebras. That doesn't seem to work. It's not standard non-commutative geometry. And we have a structure that's something like 
like a network of Hilbert space inclusions in one way of stating it. Okay, so these are only first steps and more is clearly needed to formulate a physical theory. In particular, we'd like to find the more complete structure and, and the full evolution law and so on. But uh, you know, we, we've got some pretty good guides and this seems to be where those, those guides are taking us. And then on to the problem of black holes. Well, black hole evolution itself is an important guide. You know, it's a key problem. I view it as, as key as the atomic stability problem was in classical physics, which ultimately led to quantum mechanics. Uh, and, you know, the problem of black hole evolution is suggesting that there's something deeply wrong with semi semi-classical geometry and the geometrical uh, description. Uh, I've argued that one can at least effectively describe unitary black hole, black hole evolution uh, using these kinds of small interactions that depart from that local quantum field theory description, and that these potentially have observational consequences. Uh, of course, another big question is what is the interplay between this dynamics and this structure of the gravitational substrate? Uh, that's a question for the future. Uh, there are many questions for the future here, but I hope I've at least interested you in some of these and convinced you of their importance. And so I'll uh, end there. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Steve, for such an outstanding overview on the subject. Thank uh, you. Uh, like I have enjoyed it a lot. Uh, there is a message from Professor Sean Carroll he said that he has to leave, that's why he's going, but he says hi and the talk was excellent. Okay. Yeah. And uh, um, like, we are really thankful you have given uh, like almost approximately two hours time and interacted with all of us. And uh, if now other people wants to ask short questions, then please ask because uh, it is already uh, uh, almost reached two hours limit. Okay, so yeah. if you have very short question, then please ask. Or otherwise, if you don't have any question, at least unmute yourself and give a clap for Steve for giving such an interesting talk. Okay, so, so please ask questions. Hello, you want to ask any question? I heard some sound and then suddenly it goes. Yeah, I thought I heard someone speaking up. Uh, Professor Panda, are you there? Yes, I'm here. So, the, what do you want to say about the talk? You uh, want to ask any question finally? Not question, some comments. Yeah. And, uh, I'm just, you know, what time it is in India, and uh, I have to address yeah. myself to be ready to ask you something. Yeah, it is 11 o'clock in the night, I know. Yeah. Pretty late. The statements from your lecture, what I understood is that we have to treat the black holes as a quantum object. You mentioned that, that black hole is an intrinsically quantum object. Uh, my point is that I don't know anything quantum gravity. Just from Einstein's gravity, I get a solution for a Schwarzschild black hole without knowing anything about quantum nature of space-time, quantum nature of black holes, etc. So why, am I, why should I be compelled to consider that black holes are intrinsically quantum? I have a classical black hole from Einstein's equations. Well, Annette, there are two ways of answering that. One is, uh, I think, <clears throat> we have strong indications that the whole the whole universe is quantum uh, and 
you know, so that includes black uh, so what's pretty hard to see how to, and you know, people have looked more carefully at this subject and, you know, I'm not an expert on this particular thread, but it's pretty hard to see how to reconcile sort of a hybrid system where you have a classical system, say classical gravity coupled to quantum everything else. We know everything else is quantum because we see that all the time. We're building quantum computers and stuff like that. Uh, and just in terms of internal consistency, it's very hard to, uh, to you know, put the two things together, a classical world for part of it and a quantum world for the other part. Uh, so, so that's difficult at the level of mathematical consistency. And it's also you know, sort of uneconomical. If, if part of the world, you know, a large part of the world is truly quantum, uh, then it sort of makes sense that the rest is too. Um, but Steve, I have a problem. Even if we believe that we live in a quantum world, the universe is quantum, we are human beings. But we exhibit ourselves as a classical system unless we go back what the quantum mechanics of all of us, the atoms, the, the quarks, the leptons, the, all the gravity which is controlling us. But we manifest ourselves as a classical system. But same thing should be true for a black hole in a quantum world. Why should we say that they are intrinsically quantum? Well, we are, we are, I would say, quantum. It's just that to a very, 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 very good approximation, we behave classically. Yes. And so that's been one of the themes in quantum information. And so, you know, for example, recently in the news, there's been uh, this whole discussion of uh, tests of the Wig Wigner's friend story and so on. And so, okay, they're not yet dealing with fully macroscopic objects in that context, but, you know, quantum laws have been shown to also apply to mesoscopic objects, buckyballs and things like that. So, you know, for, uh, so there, it appears perfectly consistent, coherent, uh, et cetera, that underlying our fundamental description uh, is a quantum description and you know we have an understanding of how out of something that's fundamentally quantum you can get something that looks very classical and i would say that's what's going on with us and with black holes so basically what i understand from you is there's a conflict always we try to quantize a classical system what you are saying is that no the primary thing should be the quantum object we can describe a classical limit of it. Do I understand you correctly? Yeah, and I think we have an example of that because I think if we exclude gravity, okay, yeah. if we forget about gravity, uh, I think many would say that uh, an underlying description of everything else is provided by the standard model constructed within the framework of local quantum field theory. That is a quantum that, mechanical that I, theory. That I agree, that I agree. The, but the, traditionally, we go from classical things to describe our postulates, axiom, to describe a quantum world. We believe that the world is classical, and then we go and try to find the manifestation of quantum world. But what I understand from your lecture now, and convincingly, I'm not objecting things, then no, we should consider ourselves as a quantum universe, and try to find out the classical manifestations of this. Am I yeah, correct? I, yeah, I think that, you know, even just in the case of the standard model, it's, you know, the fundamental theory there is a quantum theory, period. And then out of that emerges all the other interesting stuff we see, you know, a lot of which can look very classical. That's the fundamental underlying thing is the quantum theory. And I'm just saying, I think that applies to gravity too. Uh, I'll, I'll take this opportunity to make a remark here. What once Joe Polchinski, which is no more with us, uh, I was discussing with him, he made a statement. Before Noether's theorem, we should large supersymmetry, then come to the limit of Noether's theorem. For other Sorry, classical again? symmetries. Sorry, I, I didn't say that again. I didn't catch the whole thing. Once Joe Polchewski, in a discussion, he told me we should start from supersymmetry and come to the classical limit to understand Noether theorem, etc. 
Ah, okay. Well, you're well, that, yeah, yeah. You are like remove me his stance, and I'm very happy about that. It's, yeah, it seems and, in a similar spirit. Yes. Uh, in in my opinion, also I think we all are. We have a quantum mind. You can understand whatever it is. And that quantum mind, it's in limit, tells us what the classical world we are living in. I agree with you, but I don't know how to put it mathematically. Well, that whole business of emergence of classical from quantum, we know yeah. a lot about it, uh, but it, it does have a lot of, of course, challenges with it. And you know, there have even been serious people who have argued that maybe there are important quantum effects you know, operational and the brain level. You know, I have a colleague who's argued that, and I, I won't discuss that here, but I'll just say it is a complicated problem, you know, that fully understanding all the details of that transition from the quantum underlying reality to the classical world we seem to see. No, the region, basically, I am agreeing with you, and I am also a strong believer in that. If we believe that the Big Bang was nothing but a quantum fluctuations, so the initial point was quantum in nature. Everything else has quantum as well as classical manifestations. So it's better to understand the quantum uh, aspects of whatever you want to describe and try to see a classical limit of this. But unfortunately, our education system teaches us how to go from classical to quantum. That's the main confusion in our mind. But we believe that universe got created, well, whether it is one universe, multi-universe, whatever it is, if it got created with a quantum fluctuation out of nothing, if the quantum things which came to manifestation, then we have to go for, look for classical limit. That's the way I like your work, your uh, lecture, etc. that we are coming from the other way around. What is the correct thing? We are never a classical system went into a quantum system. We always, our universe was born as a quantum system. We are looking at the manifestation of classical system. And that's what really, really, really makes me to think about that which other way around is truth. Yeah, the idea is very interesting. Well, I think that's a, a reasonable and coherent way to look at it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Given my, some of the arguments for that. That's right, yeah. Okay, we don't know actually. And uh, Steve, I just want to uh, like ask one thing, since you have also uh, commented on this uh, unitarity of black hole information, this thing. So uh, as you have already mentioned that there are few parallel ideas and you also know that few ideas uh, like recognized this year with some prizes and something like that. Uh, you want to comment on something like uh, regarding this uh, uh, solution of uh, this paradox and a little bit more? I could say a few more words. Uh, so the basic excitement has been that uh, via a certain set of calculational prescriptions, you know, this whole replica wormhole business, uh, uh, people have, and I gave a list of, let me not try to reproduce all the names, uh, people have managed to find this um, so-called page curve where the entropy goes up and back down. That's the, the uh, real achievement that's being pointed to. Uh, of course, we knew what that curve should look like to begin with. And uh, I think the more basic question is, are there underlying quantum amplitudes? Uh, you know, you need more than just the curve. You need the underlying quantum amplitudes that are unitary. And is there some calculational scheme for describing uh, those and and how does that fit with the rest of the story we have understood with quantum gravity and so on? You know, I've made some uh, attempt with, for example, with Joaquin Turiachi to try to sort of uh, better understand the relationship between the current replica wormhole story yeah. and I have read the paper, <laughs> the okay. underlying amplitudes, and you know, this goes back to stuff I was involved in back in the late eighties. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dating myself. 
But uh, you know, there there is a real question about how that works, how you can actually apply amplitudes that are doing the right thing. And I think that's a really important unanswered question at present. I still have a question here. Oh, one other thing to say. Um, there is one suggestion for how that could work, and that is that somehow there are perhaps very big baby universes split off involving the whole black hole interior. If that's the case, the kind of effective description I've given here in the nonviolent unitarization yeah. could be a way of parameterizing the effects of such interaction. So there could be a connection, in fact, with what I'm saying, if there's an underlying coherent picture like that. Very good. Then I have this following question. If we start with everything quantum and go over to a transition to describe classical things, and in the, as, you, as you very well told, in the underlying theory of quantum evolution, one of the major concepts we use is unitarity. How do I see when the unitarity fails from going from quantum system to classical system? Is this a fresh transition? How do I see how unitarity, what fails? Yeah. How do I know that whether I go from quantum to classical, at what stage the unitarity evolution fails to describe from a quantum system to a classical system? Okay, so let me say a few words. I'm not sure if I'm quite answering that or not, but you know, there's this whole story of, you know, you can have an underlying unitary evolution in a system with many degrees of freedom. And in effect, the quantum coherence can spread out into the many degrees of freedom. Uh, yeah. And this is related to the whole story of de decoherence and so on. Yeah. You can get something that looks classical uh, when that happens. So that's you know part of a more involved uh, uh, description to really say how that works. But uh, you know that that's and you know say my colleague here Jim Hartle and the late Mary Gelman and so on have worked a lot on that as have many others. Uh, but that's so, a basic picture for how you connect. Uh, I understand the mathematical description, but going from coherence to this, this decoherence, is there a phase transition or there's a smooth transition? Well, it's really, it's something like coarse graining because if you keep track of all the underlying degrees of freedom, then it is pure unitary evolution. It, and so when you start forgetting enough degrees of freedom, it starts to look non-coherent. And, so that is the problem uh, when, when we say that? you forget about this, what exactly we mean physics wise? Sorry, what's the question? If we say that we forget about this from coarse graining, etc., and go over, that's a general statement. But what is actually the mathematical structure which says that from coarse graining to we go over to this, from quantum to class? classical transition, what is the mathematical structure? Well, again, I, uh, I'm i not sure if I have really a good answer to that, but there is this whole business, you know, there's the decoherence functional and so on. there's this whole business that has been developed to describe sort of when the, um, roughly speaking, the off-diagonal matrix elements get suppressed or whatever, when you look at evolution, uh, or look like they're getting small. And so you're getting into things that start to look more and more classical. And there are, you know, much more complete treatments of that uh, out there, but, you know, I, I shouldn't try to reproduce that here. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Steve, for your time and uh, detailed discussion with us. Hope you have also enjoyed uh, the discussions and all. And this, fun. yeah, so this will be posted in YouTube. And once it is posted, I will okay. share the link. With you. Excuse me, may I ask one question or are we out of time? Sorry. No, we are already out of time, but okay. Uh, like you can ask one question, but it shouldn't be very large because you can understand now it's already two hours. Yes. Problem is small questions sometimes lead to big answers, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, um, uh, is uh, that uh, with respect to, to the states in when when in, in quantum field theory in curved space time we have the problem of um, of uh, of defining the the vacuum and understanding what particles are. 
in in this framework you you have a um, work on the on what what they measure yeah well i think there we have a description of what the state is and we can follow the evolution of the state it's just when we try to phrase the question of what the state looks like in terms of particles we sometimes get some ambiguities, but but the underlying quantum evolution of the state seems to make sense in that context. Okay, thank you. So, at last, I want to say, uh, stay healthy, and uh, uh, like I hope things will be better very soon. We all can meet sometime, uh, like uh, in person, not virtually. And uh, yeah, so. Uh, Santan, before you finish, I have a personal request to Steve. Okay, you may. Steve, that... uh, okay, once we are out of the situation where we can normalcy returns, we can travel. I'll be happy to have you in India in my institute called Niger and spend at least a week and give few lectures to my students, which are undergraduate as well as PhD. I love to have you here and please do consider my request seriously. Thank you. It would be great to get back to India one of these days. Yes, yeah, yeah. As soon as the normals you come back, I will send you a mail and uh, I will request to find out your one way time. Uh, you can come. Even with family, you can come. I have no problem. And uh, But I would like to have you in my institute and give this to talks like this to my students so that they will be encouraged in quantum gravity towards, we start with quantum gravity and go towards classical gravity. That's <laughs> what I would like to you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, Steve, I will be getting in touch with you regarding the thing that I have written. Uh, but uh, yeah, like uh, I will send you the email uh, once this uh, talk is, will be posted in YouTube. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And thanks for uh, listening. I hope you yeah. have uh, learned something you find it, interesting. No, it was really nice talk. I, personally, I have enjoyed a lot. Great.